Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our panel. Thank you for coming. My name is Char Denord. I'm going to introduce members of our panel, and then we're going to have a conversation um, up here for a, a little while, and then save, save some room, 10, 15 minutes, for some questions as well afterwards. So uh, this gives me great pleasure to introduce Charles Simic to you, immediately to my right. Um, Charles Simic is the former poet laureate of the United States and the author of over 60 books of poetry, as well as several books of, 60 books of poetry. Is that, is that right? Can you verify that? That's what it says. 59? 59? Uh, okay. Well, that counts. That, that counts. Okay, 60 books. Um, as well as several books of essays and translations of French, Serbian, Croatian, Macedonian, and Slovenian poetry, which all count. He received the Pulitzer Prize for poetry in 1990 for his book, The World Doesn't End. His other awards and honors include Guggenheim Fellowship, the Frost Medal, the MacArthur Foundation Grant, and an NEA. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts uh, and Letters in 1995. Carolyn Frechet, immediately to my right, is the director of the Lannan Poetry for, uh, Center for Poetry and Poetics and holds the Lannan Chair in Poetry at Georgetown University. She has received a Guggenheim, which enabled her to travel to El Salvador, where she worked as a human rights advocate and poet and poet journalist. Her second book, The Country Between Us, uh, was published with the help of Margaret Atwood, who received the Poetry Society of America's Alice Faye D. Castagnola Award, and was also um, the Lamont Poetry Selection of the Academy of American Poets. Uh, she won the 2006 Robert Creeley Award and most recently Yale University's Wyndham Campbell Prize. Her books of poetry include Blue Hour, The Angel of History, The Country Between Us, and Gathering the Tribes. She's also the editor of Against Forgetting, 20th Century Poetry of Witness, and the co-editor of Poetry of Witness, The Tradition in English, 1500 to 2001. Immediately to my left, Nicole Seeley was born in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands, and raised in Florida. She earned a, an MLA in African Studies from University of Southern Florida and an MFA in Creative Writing from New York University. She is the author of the full-length collection, The Animal After Whom Other Animals Are Named, winner of the Drinking Gourd Chapbook Poetry Prize. Her other honors and awards include Elizabeth George Foundation Grant, the Stanley Kunitz Memorial Prize, a Daniel Varosian Award and Poetry International Prize. She has been both a Cave Conum graduate fellow and a, a Poetry Project fellow and is currently the program's director. She, uh, her new book, Ordinary Beast, is just out and has been named one of Publisher, Publishers Weekly's top 10 poetry um, for the fall of 19, uh, 2017 uh, and NPR's most anticipated book, poetry books of 2017. Here to my far left is David Tomas Martinez. He's the author of Hustle, which received the New England Book Festival Prize in Poetry, the Devil's Kitchen Reading Award, $10,000, as honorable mention for the Antonio Cisneros del Moro Prize. His second book, Post Traumatic Hood Disorder, is due out in 2018. A Canto Mundo Fellow, David has served as an editor for Gulf Coast and has contributed to the Voz Alta Project in Barrio Logan. He is a Canto Mundo Fellow and recipient of a 2017 NEA Grant Pushcart Prize, the Valerain Prize, and the Stanley P. Young Fellowship from Breadloaf. So it's a great pleasure to have all of these folks up here. Um, so um, I have a few questions for all of these uh, for panel members. I'm, I'm going to start with you, Charlie, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to start with a quote, a famous quote, from a poet named W.H. Auden, who said, poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its making, where executives would never want to tamper. It flows on south from ranches in isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns that we believe and die in. It survives a way of happening, a mouth 
And that's from Auden's In Memory of W.B. Yeats. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you would define um, Auden's reference to mouth there. Poetry doesn't make anything happen, but it survives as a mouth in the, the valley, as he says, of its breathing. Well, I mean, I think what, what he had in mind, uh, <clears throat> does this work? Yes. Just hold it a little okay. closer, maybe. Um, I mean, you know, poetry doesn't stop armies. It's not a, you know, a, a conqueror. Uh, closer, okay, uh, like that. <laughs> Uh, poetry doesn't, you know, doesn't stop armies invading, you know, some country or uh, stop injustice in the world. Uh, but uh, so, in po political impact of poetry is, is next to zero. I mean, historically, uh, 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 unless you include epic poetry. I mean, obviously, epic poetry, uh, epic poems in various cultures, you know, had a great deal of, to do with. Uh, uh, was the survival of that culture and, and etc. But uh, I think what I would disagree with him. Yes, poetry makes something happen. It happens. The event occurs between two human beings who have never met before. Uh, someone who has picked up a book of poems. Uh, I used to work in bookstores uh, uh, when I was young, and I used to observe this. I mean, I knew where the poetry section was. And somebody who's obviously in a store like this, you know, to meet someone, this is library, uh, to meet uh, someone and just, you know, to the other person is very late, so eventually, you know, they're browsing, but eventually they end up in the, in the poetry section. And uh, so, you know, poetry books are easy to see from a distance because they're very thin. And, uh, and they would pull a book out, they would look at it, uh, for the second, you know, a few pages, put it back on, put it back on, and um, again, you know, look at their watch. Um, and, and so there's an event which I've observed you know, <laughs> a number of times, which is when someone, you know, opens the book, reads something, and then, you know, put it back on the shelf, but then holds back, it goes back, and clearly is rereading the same poem that they had read before. And then, when they stop, they, they turn some pages, they read something else. Uh, well, I mean, just, you know, if you take that little event, I mean, something could happen there. Yeah. Uh, because at some point, I mean, after that person is occupied uh, for a while with the book, They'll turn it back to see what the price is. <laughs> uh, so that tells you something. And uh, again, you know, they check the, the name. Uh, you know, they, don't, they have no idea what this is, what this point is. I mean, uh, the name means nothing to them. But just opening, out of sheer boredom, of wasting time, uh, and encountering a poem. I, mean, I have no idea what poem they, they, they're reading. It meant enough for them to reread it and then, you know, actually buy the book. <laughs> so uh, I think these sort of encounters between two human beings are, you know, it constantly happens. I mean, and this, this is still happening today in the, in the, you know, in the world. I mean, someone is opening a book and, and finding a poem that uh, they have to reread. They have to several times and, uh, and there's sort of, I mean, if that's not an event, it, it's a huge event. I mean, uh, there's something in that poem that engages them deeply, uh, makes them want to read that poem again and again, and that, so to say, you know, nothing happens, plenty happens. Mm. Thank you. Wonderful. Carolyn. You once uh, wrote, in times like these, and from what I know of the world, one must marshal inner strength, must be courageous and resolute, calm and vigilant, must connect with others of like mind, must not compromise with racism, bigotry, and hatred, but must also be quietly prepared for consequences of every confrontation, must do so anyway, must go to every length to protect others. Not many humans can do this. 
Many will live as many lived in Eastern Europe and in Russia under totalitarianism. They will mind their own business, get what they can to survive and go about their daily lives. That's all right for them. We should not be judgmental. But there were dissidents too, and they worked together, and after decades of work, the system came down. So, do you feel the voices of witness today in this country can have a similar effect on this present regime? Yes. <laughs> I suppose you want me to say more, right? That's enough. <laughs> okay. Next question. <laughs> you have another question. If so, why? If so, why? That's, that's always the way the teachers do it, right? Yeah. If so, why? Give examples. Give three examples from the text. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's always how it works, really. But we're in, we're in those times now. I, I think we all know this. Um, we're in dire times. The planet is in peril through environmental depredation. Our political institutions are in jeopardy. Uh, what we do now as citizens, as ordinary human beings, as people in our communities matters significantly. Uh, when I wrote that, it was just after 45 was elected. And I was asked to, I think it was you, Shell, who asked me. <laughs> to write something, to say something, you know, in that moment. And, mm -hmm. and so that's what that was. And it, it has to do with protecting people who are most vulnerable in our situation. And most people in this audience are not most vulnerable. People of color are most vulnerable. Undocumented people are most vulnerable. Eventually, everyone will be vulnerable. Um, many people here are vulnerable to the crumbling health care system. So, um, those who can must try to protect those who are vulnerable until the end. I mean, what we have to do is do our best and the most ethical thing in every moment of our remaining lives. And that's all we have to worry about, really. And it, it's a lot to worry about, but that's... That's all I can say about that. It doesn't, I'm not speaking here specifically as a poet. I'm speaking here ju just as a human being um, who happens to be a citizen of this country in this moment. And things that we thought would never happen are happening in our midst. So this is our moment. We might have always wondered as children what we would do if this or that ever occurred and what we would have done more importantly in history if we had been there. We're about to find out. Thank you. Nicole, this, this question follows, I think, uh, aptly poignantly on what Carolyn just said. You've written, everything aspires to one degradation or another. I want to learn how to make something holy and walk away. Could you talk a little about that? Sure. I, I think. Um can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of that excerpt, I was thinking more about the process of writing itself mm -hmm. um, and how we attempt to create something. Um, at least for me, I attempt to create something. And by the time I think the thing is finished, I'm not sure if I want to let it go for fear that it won't be received in the way that I intended it to be received. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what that quote is, is speaking to. The poem itself is uh, about the creation of what is called an Mbari in Nigeria. And so the, the people of Nigeria, they create this Mbari. Uh, it's a, it's a, like a mansion in honor of a local deity. And it's after a, a, a plague or after a storm. Um, just to honor the deities and um, make sure they're appeased. Mm -hmm. um, and after they create this mansion with all these details and these statues, they, they walk away from it and let it deteriorate naturally. Mm -hmm. And so how do, I, how do I do that with my work? Um, how do I create something and put all this love into it and then just walk away and let it do what it's supposed to do in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what 
I was thinking about uh, with those last lines in that poem. Well, that, that reminds me of something that Stanley Kunitz once said. He, he said, to live as a poet in this culture is the aesthetic equivalent of a major political statement. Uh, and it sounds like your aspiration to create that holiness is um, similar, is uh, pertinent to his point there. I think so. Can you repeat that? Quote? Sure. To live as a poet in this culture is the aesthetic equivalent of a major political statement. I think so. I think when I told my parents I wanted to be a poet, they were they were confused. <laughs> they were really they confused. didn't get it. No, no. I studied initially to become a veterinarian. And so I did. I, I love animals. Oh, what a disappointment. I, exactly. What a disappointment. Um, and actually, when my, when my chapbook came out, it's, a chapbook is a smaller version of a full length. It's like half the size. Um, I gave it to them, and they, they said, oh, what's this? Is this... What, what is this? This isn't a book. This is just this half thing. That, um, so yeah, it's, it's a pamphlet. Yeah. And so I think the choice of becoming a poet was, um, in fact, a political one initially because it went against everything that I was told that I should become. Um, and so just the very act of doing it is in itself a political act. How do they feel now? Oh, they, they love it. Okay, they came around. Yeah, they, I, I brought them around. Yeah. David, I'm actually going to read a, a poem of yours because I, I think I have to in order to ask this question. But um, in your poem, Chicano Park, you capture an ethos and lifestyle that betrays the deception of the American dream, especially in the last lines, where you indict the dream as a double-edged sword, essentially. So I, I think I have to read not very long that and then I wonder if you could talk about that sure sure, sure. okay in Chicano Park no matter if that no matter if half the park is concrete and stanchions supporting a bridge near industrial buildings yellow in the sun there's stalks of smoke soaring awake next to empty lots and bus stops without seats or signs or schedules near houses bright and paint the color of dented cans of spam men walking the streets to walk look longingly towards their doors, no matter if all the murals decay and the statue of Zapata falls, more months piled to be swept and years ironed, folded and put away in drawers. And if jail bars bite off chunks of your view, remember a wise gambler's words on craps, call for the dice back. And between rolls, wipe the dust off the dice as bills coil a foot in the wind because life is wild emotion lying in the grass, soon to be green. Not even bags of chips, cheetahs with wind, avoid being tackled, gouged, and ripped apart. We all eventually submit, are arched over by a hyena grin, and growl in the sun. Soon the spots will show, and the world will pull tight with relief as the jungle rallies around us, as we smile now and cry later. So. Uh, what do you say? What was I? What were you asking again? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was caught by the beauty of that. Uh, <laughs> again. The yes. yes. <laughs> um, just if you, if you could talk about uh, that ethos and the kind of double-edged uh, um, nature of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, one immediately thinks of double consciousness, and uh, I attempted to write that poem in that. I, I think one of um, what, what I try to do is I, I, I try to extricate all sentimentality from my poems. And for me, like for me, the romantics aren't somebody that like, I, I like done, and, but they're, they're not somebody that I aspire to be. Uh, mostly because when I was reading the romantics, I was like, I want an answer. And even though you couldn't, you know, um, so I, uh, in that poem, I wanted to have this sort of like peeking through something that I thought was difficult and um, because I don't believe in the Horatio Alger myth. You know, like, one cannot pick them up themselves up by their bootstraps. Um, particularly if you have... Um, no boots? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, my boots are all right. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's difficult, and that's a myth. And, I mean, in, in the way that... Um, you know, religion has been used the way this, you know, and for me growing up, you know, there's three, three ways out of the hood. 
you were either an athlete, an entertainer, or a drug dealer. And that was it. That's the only way that we saw it. My, my, my parents, my dad was a landscaper. My mom worked in the office. They're not college educated. My mom had me at 16. Her mom had her, uh, or had her first kid at 15. I had a kid at 17. Uh, that is an efficacious way of, uh, like, you know, towards, uh, you know, the 1%. Uh, it's just not working. <laughs> you know. uh, so, you know, growing up in that way, I mean, you sort of, you know, I didn't expect to, I didn't expect to be a poet. So, um, that was a very securitous answer. I, I apologize. Does the word witness resonate for you at all, as far as um, these two books? Y yes, yes. Well, of course, because uh, as I, you know, Carolyn's here. I mean, like her book was the book that launched a thousand ships, right? And in the and in the eighties, that that's the. Con I mean, I remember like eighty poetics in the way that I remember the Boston Celtics of the fifties. Uh, you know, it's like I wasn't there for Bill Russell, but like I've seen the footage. You know, and like I was like, how is he a six nine center that could guard Will? Like that's amazing, and I feel that way about uh, about Miss Roche. Like you know, I feel that that way. Um, you know, but also though, out of those conversations, I think came important essays like Spivax, can the subaltern speak? You know, like that's an important essay, and and that question, can they? And ultimately, she, I think, you know, it's like no. And to, so we need allies initially, but at some point as a, as a Latinx, as a Chicano, I need, to be able to, I need to be able to speak, not for my community, but for my existence, to be able to like present an identity. And one that I need to be able to speak for myself. I can't have other people speak for me, but like it needs to start with somebody needs to speak. Mm, thanks. Charlie. I think you know this poem, Mr. Cogito's Envoy. And in the middle of it, he writes, by his big new Herbert, you were saved not in order to live. You have little time. You must give testimony. Be courageous when the mind deceives you. Be courageous. In the final account, only this is important. And let your helpless anger be like the sea whenever you hear the voice of the insulted and beaten. Let your sister's scorn not leave you for the informers, executioners, cowards. They will win. They will go to your funeral and with relief will throw a lump of earth. The wood borer will write your smoothed over biography. And do not forgive. Truly, it is not in your power to forgive in the name of those betrayed at dawn. <coughs> um, Herbert was a very smart man. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> he understood I mean, his history and, and, and the, the kind of <clears throat> um, predicament of a poet in, well, I mean, in Eastern Europe, obviously. Um, uh, many of them, you know, wrote for years in Poland and, of course, in Russia, too, what they used to say for the throne. I mean, they couldn't publish those poems, and, uh, and so they said. Uh, but they had to be written because, well, they had to be written. And, uh, not because we thought that they would reach people out there, maybe nobody would read it, but uh, there's at least what has to say. Um, and um, uh, just one little anecdote about uh, Herbert. I, uh, I went last month, uh, actually in August, uh, in Macedonia, in, uh, in the Balkans, uh, in Struga, there is a famous poetry festival, international poetry festival, for 56 years. It's been, not continuously, but every year. Uh, and uh, I met Herbert there uh, in 1972. I, I met him before in New York, and, uh, but uh, I met him there. And uh, so uh, this was you know, communist Yugoslavia, uh, sort of liberal a little bit, compared to Soviet Union and the other. Uh, East European states, but still, you know, communist country. So they would always take you out to, to look at something like, you know, for example, we were taken out to see the statue of, uh, uh, of a fallen Macedonian hero uh, who was, uh, we had 
fort, ma mi dico che si può forti Nazis or I don't think if you've got the Nazis, but the Bulgarians over there. Uh, <clears throat> during the Second World War. And uh, so we go over there and uh, uh, <clears throat> huge, uh, in, in, in a hill, so the mountains, so many low, drive up and, uh, and there, you probably have to see that. There's a huge, huge statue and, and he is, uh, the hero is, uh, I think he had a little, one of Russia, a little, these guns, you know, with automatic uh, weapons and uh, holding that. And, uh, and there was a young woman who, obviously, a university student, who explained in English uh, what he did, I mean, how he was in the Second World War. And uh, when she was done, I mean, everyone's just get back in the cars and get the hell out of there, have lunch, or, you know. Uh, Herbert said, uh, the man who wrote these lines, he said, uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me, you pray, miss, uh, I have a question. Uh, he says, and where are the graves of the, uh, uh, of, of the people your hero killed? Uh, and, uh, you know, where can we take a look at them? Uh, and, uh, I mean, she was so you know, scared, astonished, but I mean, also frightened. I mean, this seemed like a provocation. There were some Russian poets there, too. Soviet Union, really, kind of green party apparatchiks, and uh, they were muttering, I mean, but you know, it was kind of international provocation. And this was a, uh, I mean, uh, Herbert uh, always knew that um, uh, behind every hero, behind every good story, you know, there's a graveyard someplace. Uh, somebody had to pay for it. And uh, and, well, of course, nothing happened, but uh, that, that was Herbert. And uh, uh, I, uh, uh, his, uh, the last suspicion that that cynicism sometimes can, can become almost, almost too much, but uh, living as we do in an, in an age uh, of cynicism and hypocrisies, uh, it really, reading Herbert is uh, refreshing. Yeah. Uh, you realize that uh, what seemed a very dark vision of humanity and uh, uh, is actually a correct vision. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Carol, I'm going to ask you a question that um, it's actually a quote from Charles Simic. <laughs> but I would like you to. Can help me, right? No, we can't I help can you. Ask no. A friend. No. No. no, this is you're all you're on your own here. Right? Okay. He said once, at least since Emerson and Whitman, there's a cult of experience in American poetry. Our poets, when one comes right down to it, are always saying, this is what happened to me. This is what I saw and felt. Truth, they never get tired of reiterating, is not something that al already exists in the world, but something that needs to be rediscovered almost daily. Um, so in this time, when I think a lot of people are kind of thinking about the future and their future specifically, as, um, which is absolutely, you know, essential really for writing and creative freedom, um, how does that quote redound on what's going on today as far as the, the arts and artists uh, and everybody else? In the sense of there being a cult of experience or? Of, as far as they're reiterating, um, not something that already exists in the world, but something that needs to be rediscovered almost daily. In terms of individual experience. In terms of individual experience, or to, you know, to, to quote uh, Pound, making new, making the new poem. I don't make know that there's a contradiction between making new and writing out of one's experience. I'm not quite sure what else we would write out of. Mm you know, that, that in a certain sense, in a broad sense, of, yeah. than our own experience. Well, maybe another way of asking you this question specifically is, after you wrote uh, um, your first book, right. um, and even uh, The Country Between Us, you, 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 be, you became very suspect of the subjective I. I got tired of, of the I because I was trapped in it. You know, it was my I. I got bored with my eye for a while, and I, I felt that I was, uh, I, w I wanted to see if there was a way to make 
you know, to, to let that go somehow. And for me, it was just looking upon the world, you know, and looking upon the world for a long time and hoping when my pen dropped to the page that something of the world outside of this perception of the eye would take over and take hold and be there on the page. I don't think I have any say at all in the matter of what I write in poetry. I don't make a conscious decision about this matter. Because if I do, I'm trapped in my conscious mind. I'm trapped in my intention. Nothing magical happens on the page at all. So I have to wait, and I think what that implies is that what's going to come to the page depends on what your deepest obsessions are and, and your consciousness in that moment, in, at all levels of your consciousness in that moment. So the least, the, you do not want to make a determination prior to picking up the pen in that sense, right? But I did have the idea that I need to get away from this I, I, I all the time, right? And, and I think it was just a certain kind of first person that I was trying to escape. Um, maybe a, a, a first person that was overly concerned about itself and, uh, and overly, uh, um, focused upon itself and its own problems and suffering and so on. And, and I wanted to look outside. So I found out you can't get rid of the I. It's always there. If you put the little personal pronoun you know, in the poem or not, it will be there. You can't get away from yourself, okay? If you're going to write, you're stuck with whoever you are. Okay. So, as I am. So, I, I don't know if that answers the question it, or not. It, it, I think it, it certainly begins to, and I, maybe I'll turn to Nicole for a follow-up on, on that. Um, uh, don't mind, Nicole. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you know, so, um, that's what Carolyn just said reminds me of one of William Blake's great quotes, where he said, uh, the most sublime act that one can commit is to place another before you. So you're not omitting the I, um, but you are you are involving the, the other within your uh, within your worldview or within your personal view. Yeah, I think uh, Carolyn is, is is right. We can't escape ourselves, um, but we also have to um, consider that everything, every experience we've ever had. Um, prior to the moment we've picked up the pen, um, every person we've ever been in contact with, everything has, will influence what we write on the page. Mm. So it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a combination of um, the self, um, her obsessions, mm. and what she has experienced up until that moment. Mm. Um, and it includes everyone she's experienced, and I would argue too, those who haven't yet come who aren't yet existing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in that way we're in conversation with those that have come before and those mm -hmm. who will come after. Mm -hmm. Right, can, David, you want to follow Yeah, up? can I get in sure. on this? Sure. Absolutely. I was like, yo. Uh, no, this is something that I think is, is, is a very interesting and, and like we were talking, I'm starting this third book and this is an idea that I'm, that I'm like right up, I'm like, okay, like I'm gonna, like my books, I mean, excuse me, so far, my books. Uh, unlike Mr. Simic, I don't have 60 books. You know, I, have, I have two. Uh, <laughs> it sounds so paltry next. I was like, oh man. It's like I was feeling good and then I heard 60. And, I was like, you know. and of course, like, you, know, you want everything as well. I was like, shit, man. I was like, I was like half those prizes my grandmother gave me. Um, <laughs> She's influential uh, in my family. Uh, that's it. <laughs> and she's dead. <laughs> no more prizes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The big prize. Um, but uh, one of the ideas, though, that I'm really going to start to this, and I'm sort of, you know, Freud talks about vanquishing the father as being an important part of maturation. That it's in that poem. But I'm starting to, and I've 
I invented, you know what I mean? Like this neologism, the you father. And I think that's really sort of what it is about, okay? That's we're trying to extricate the I, and that's what Eliot's talking about. But I think that's a misnomer to think that, oh, well, you know, they, he's not talking about like taking out a personality as far as to be boring, because Eliot's poems are no, are, aren't boring, they're filled with voice. He's just, I think, talking about taking all the boring, all the fear, all of that stuff. And so, like, for me, the you father, in a sense, is like taking out the patriarchal, taking out the violence, the, um, the and I don't like this word, but this is like a, a phrase, like the toxic max masculinity, as we're calling it, that part. It's all the part of, of like, the of, of manhood that we pass, you know, that we beat into uh, each other. Um, the sort of inheritance of violence. Um, and that you father is like, you know, how does one, how does one take the you father? And I think, I, you know, the, the gentleman right here has this root right there. And I mean, for me, like the, the, the masculinity, like racism, all of these things, like it's the root and we only see the leaf or the, the structures. And like, how do we pull that? And, you know, and so like, you know, and, and, and for me, one of the, the avenues I'm, uh, I'm exploring is this idea of the you father, so. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Let me just uh, yep, just ask Charlie, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember what the, what the context was for that, uh, that piece that I wrote about. But uh, at some point, um, Whitman and Emerson, yeah. we, we, we got fed up with confessional poetry. Yeah. Uh, I mean, confessional poetry, uh, you know, the imitators of sex, the large, low, uh, and uh, th there was a kind of idiocy there, the, the notion that uh, what makes the poem valuable is that I'm really telling you that this really happened, you know, on the Thursday, last Thursday, and so forth and so forth. Well, what, is, what is stupid about that is that, uh, I mean, the eye is, exists in poetry, you know, going back to Sappho. I mean, you know, Sappho, all of a sudden, uh, started speaking in first person, and it's clearly herself, uh, I mean, there were, you know, other poets were using the first person pronoun, but it, when she speaks, I mean, it's, it's me. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's this sort of uh, I that appears later on in lyric poetry. I mean, that's the difference between the epic poetry and lyric poetry. And uh, the reason, you know, um, Sappho's work was pretty much destroyed already by the ancients because, uh, the, to use the eye in this very you know, personal way is very subversive. I mean, she says in a fragment of a poem, I'd rather watch my you know, girlfriend take off her skirt than, than you know, see the Trojan and Greek army arrayed for battle, you know? And they say, what the fuck, you know? <laughs> Who does she think she is, you know? These are heroes, you know? So anyway, you know, okay. So, but the, this eye, which must exist, you know, in, in the centuries, I mean, you have it also in Chinese poetry, you have it in, you know, uh, the notion that, um, and this is another thing that offended us about the confessional poets, the notion that these people are sort of reporting, saying everything, exactly what happened to them. The point always was to sound sincere. Now, I mean, Sappho, we know very little about Sappho, uh, uh, but she sounds extremely sincere. She's always, you know, suffering and so forth. You know, it turns out she was a very wealthy woman. I mean, she was not somebody, you know, a beggar standing on the corner. And uh, the eye is a, is a great invention in, in, in literary poetry. Poetry, and as to, you know, <laughs> I mean, if this really was, you know, when Catullus or the great Roman poets, uh, you know, Ovid, uh, well, I mean, I'll tell you about Ovid. Uh, Ovid wrote great love poems, fantastic love poems. Uh, when he was very young, his first um, poem was called Amores. Uh, and uh, the idea was that this, it was this young man, I mean, he was actually only about 17, 18 when he wrote these poems. Uh, he had come from the provinces to Rome, this ancient Rome, you know, about 2,000 years ago at least. Yeah. And um, the, the idea was that he, he Probably went, you know, every night, I mean, Rome was a big city, I mean, as corrupt as any modern city, you know, today, you know, going to parties and hanging out and uh, on and on and on and on. And uh, it, it took uh, centuries to figure out that um, actually uh, he got married 
I was about 18, and I think his wife was like 16. And uh, as one of the scholars says, uh, there, there's no evidence that he ever went anywhere. Uh, but obviously, Mr. and Mrs. Ovid never got out of bed, you know. Uh, so he's tremendous for knowledge about uh, sexuality, human sexuality came from, you know, from this. So it, in other words, it's all invented. It's all invented. A party boy who is, you know, always on the streets. Uh, uh, and, you know, able to observe the rest of the, you know, human, uh, Roman society and so forth. So complete, you know, you could say he was lying. Of course, uh, he was making things up. Because imagination is, is one of the most important components of poetry. I mean, we think, you know, when we read Whitman, and, uh, that he actually, that everything was just the way he said it. Uh, that he didn't edit this, that he didn't, you know, it wasn't his, you know, his memory contributed, his imagination. Of course, he had a vast experience because he was a, a journalist in New York City and you know, roamed the streets, you know, for years and so forth, but still, uh, uh, it's, this is not, you know, kind of confessional poetry, and, uh, and so that was a, that was the core. I mean, saying, yeah. you know, come on, use your yeah. imagination, make yeah. it up. Who yeah. cares, you know? Yeah. If it sounds good, we'll buy it. And it's know? true. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah. Just one more question to follow up, and then I want to turn the yeah. conversation over. This but back back to Blake, because your comment about Whitman reminded, reminded me of placing another before you. Um, and this, this is also a time when I think it's difficult for lots of people to place another before them. But the country's become very divided. I, I read in the paper today, the Washington Post, that 46% of Republicans believe that Trump should drop a nuclear bomb on North Korea. That's the latest Quinnipiac poll. So how do you place another before you who has such hideous, odious, ideas and listen to them and exercise what um, Malcolm Cowley called that transpersonal self in, in the speaker that Whitman was so uh, adept at. Well, I mean, Christian religion was supposed to remind him of that, but if you notice, I mean, I used to I get to do a couple of pieces for New York Review you know, books of, of, over the years, uh, uh, which required that I spend Hours and hours of watching, you know, TV evangelists uh, watching, you know, uh, Christian networks and so forth. And uh, it's very, very rare that you hear the word poor. I mean, empathy, compassion, occasionally, you know, so sort of abstractly, but it, it's not a component. Uh, uh, so uh, it's a, why this is like that. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated story. I mean, uh, uh, in the fifties, there were still a lot of people remember the Second World War. So many Americans died, fought in that war, came back maimed, and so forth. Even you know, after the later on, Korean War, terrible Vietnam War. So uh, I, I don't think you get those numbers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they always, you know, people mm. are, you know, yeah. you know, like that stuff, you know, slaughter. Yeah. Uh, but uh, today, mm. obviously, we've forgotten everything we ever knew. Yeah. It reminds me of a story I read in the New York Times a couple of days ago. Sarah Silverman, actually, the comedian, is yeah. traveling around the country just listening to Republicans. She's a staunch Democrat. She's from New Hampshire. Too. Yeah, I know. She's from New Hampshire. I know. I know. Um, and, and she's, uh, she's, just do, she's not saying a word. She's just listening. Yeah. And she has some interesting things to say about that. Anyway, that's yeah. sort of beyond the point. But I have one last question for you. So you're looking at. Well, they're, they're asked the question, should we drop a nuclear bomb on North Korea? They're not asked, shall we destroy both North and South Korea and everyone who lives in both of those, those parts of Korea? Should we kill 68,000 stationed US servicemen while we're doing that? because of course you're not going to evacuate those servicemen in four minutes. Um, are we going to radiate that part of Asia, including our ally Japan? They don't, they're not asked that question. They're just asked, should we drop the bomb on North Korea? This is not a species of thinking, okay? 
Thank you. <laughs> okay, just a short, very short answers on this. I was like, but it's a specious. Specious. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you've, you've all heard this quote. In, in a dark time, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. Uh, Brecht. Uh, so, how do we go about singing? Continuing to sing. We just a, maybe if we could just answer that briefly, and then we'll turn over the chair. Well, I mean, it's always something to think about. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, you know, ask yourself how do we sing? Uh, you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you don't ask yourself that question. I mean, you, you, you write. I mean, because you, you, I have to write. I mean, and, uh, uh, but it's not that I ask myself, how can I possibly, you know, write about these times? Uh, I mean, how? This is not not the question. I sent it so. No. Good answer. Yeah. yeah. This quote is what I opened against forgetting with. And it means you will always write about whatever is going on. But yeah. there's a quote at the end, which is also a motto of Bertolt Brecht. And it is, um, this then is all. It's, it comes at the end of all these poems. This then is all is not enough, I know. At least I'm still alive, as you can see. I'm like the man who took a brick to show how beautiful his house used once to be. And that's what poets will do. They'll pick up the brick and they will show you what used to be their house. Nice. Nicole? Yeah, I couldn't have said it better, <laughs> Carolyn um, or Charles. Um, yeah, I think we, we just have to continue writing and um, living and not letting um, these things affect how we go about doing that. Um, you know, despite that fact, I'll continue to serve my community, I'll continue to write, I'll continue to love, I'll continue to have my husband and, and be in Brooklyn and hopefully have a dog at some point. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'll just continue being black and in love and, and beautiful yeah. and loving my life. It reminds me, I read that poem, part of that poem by Big New Herbert. Uh, it ends, the last line of the poem is, go, be faithful. David. Um, Go, be faithful. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm suspicious of that quote because, you know, my viewpoint is one of, from, you know, as a Chica, uh, Chicano, you know, and like when 45 passes and many of Americans feel safe again, I won't. I'm not going to feel safe. My folks won't feel safe. Mi gente won't feel safe. So, like, you know, where are we gonna be then? Mm -hmm. You know? Because, uh, you know, it's back to Sunday dinners. You know what I mean? But we still have a immigration policy that is uh, inequitous, to say the least. Um, so while I'm gonna continue to write, that's a whole nother bag, what I'm gonna do. I write because I enjoy writing, and, I, and I, it's an end for me. You know, or excuse me, it's a means, you know what I mean? It's not an end, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's something that I, that I feel very powerfully about. Um, hell, man, you know, but like, I can read Pound. I read his essays, they're very important to me. You know, I may not necessarily agree with what that cat has to say, but that's because like I enjoy that path. Like I'm in, you know, I'm in the car. Yeah, that's not a Mexican joke. Uh, <laughs> you know, like that's, you know, and so, you know, but like I'm, when I hear dark, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, you know, I see this side of the band. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's take a few questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, back here. Uh, let me let me just go back there. I'll just stand and project. Uh, okay. I'll preface by saying forgive this because I think it's a little bit of a scattershot question, but I think that this is a loaded environment to ask it in. Um, I want to start the questioning by returning to this question about Emerson and Thoreau. I'm a student of Emerson and Thoreau. Emerson and Whitman. Emerson and Whitman, yeah. and for me Thoreau, but yeah, yeah Emerson Whitman. <laughs> and this poetry of witness, I think, really becomes in a way a kind of personal dead end, as you're saying, well, this is what happened to me. And I wa really wonder 
if this American experiment, this American myth, needs to be reborn out of a sense of this is what happens to us. And I think this is something we see in Whitman attempting to do, and I think that this is something we're waiting to see people do now. And I feel like more and more that this is a project we're waiting to see Native poets doing, and Chicano poets doing, and Black poets doing, and people who still have ethnicity who know how to speak as we. I feel like, uh, okay. Yeah, speak right into it. So sure. Uh, I feel like as white people who have been kind of fragmented into a culture of individualism and personal witness, we're waiting to see what kind of we we can be included again. And I feel like, you know, the predictions that the future is brown, I, I love that. I can't wait to see what kind of we we get to be part of once this culture of individual, this my personal <coughs> testimony um, leads to. I think that the Emersonian and Whitmanian uh, insistence on perpetual innocence has kept us from, has prevented us from feeling this age-old grief that natives have known since forever, have lived with since forever, that people with ethnicity and religion and culture have just lived with forever. And I, I guess my question is, where do you see that the new poetry of kind of advocacy or poetry of new community gestating? Well, I mean, Blake answered this though, right? That's the age of innocence and experience. I mean, but we still haven't learned. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, man. <laughs> Thank you. Um, two things come to my mind. Um, first is the book by Helen uh, Wendler, um, the, the Music of What Happens. And that was a line from a poem by uh, Seamus Haney. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Oh. But, um, and the idea is that poetry isn't what happens, it's the music of what happens. And that's what makes it universal. That's what makes the, the I, a lyric I, makes it a universal I. And it's intuitive to poets, I think, to have that pattern of sounds, pattern of thoughts, pattern of images that we as a species can bring our felt experience to. We can bring our lives to it because it has that emotion in it. And, and we're not feeling the emotion of the poet, we're feeling the emotion of the poem. And so I, I have no problem with poems with I. There can be poems with you that are universal, poems of whatever. But, and then the other thing that comes to my mind is something that Robert Frost said, that poetry isn't a thing of grievances, such as you know political grievances or whatever, but of grief. You bring your grief about these things into the poem through your images and your, the, the music that moves you. Okay, thanks. Does anybody have a question? Or? I don't have a question, but I want to speak to the young man's question. Where are you? Um, the we question. In the oh, here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think when we think about whiteness, um, we think about the lack of ethnicity, and, and that's, I think ethnicity is not a social construct, but whiteness is. And so when we think about white people, we should they're included in the universal we because they're not without culture and ethnicity. And I think that's um, a failure of our imagination and um, what whiteness and white privilege and white supremacy does in this country. Um, it makes white people apart from the we and it makes um, us think that um, white supremacy is real but it's one of the biggest lies ever told. And so when we think about white people, we really should just think about um, their inclusion in the we because it's, it's real. Like we're all people, we're all humans, and we all have culture. And whiteness, white people are not excluded from that fact. And, uh, and that idea has been challenged more than ever today by the division here. But we've been seeing in Charlottesville and elsewhere. Um, how are we doing? Anybody else have a question or comment? I have a question for yeah. Over here? Um, yeah. yeah. Wait, here's a microphone coming. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Nicole, 
Um, I just wondered, I, I read, you know, you're born in St. Thomas, but it sounds like you lived mostly growing up in Florida, but do you have more, res do you feel a responsibility now to write more about St. Thomas or your heritage? And I feel, I didn't know that people weren't allowed to vote for president, and I thought I was pretty informed on things. Um, I think my work is influenced by, again, everything that I have gone through in my life. So it's it's being born in St. Thomas, having been raised in, in Florida, having gone to a, a black college for the first couple of years of my, my schooling and, and um, you know, having studied Africana studies. So all of these things will inform my work, um, as does being born in the Caribbean. And, and those things influence my obsessions and um, I write about them in my book, um, being black, being a woman, um, so I think it all comes together um, in the work. Uh, I couldn't pinpoint to individual moments, but I think as a collection of experiences, they all point. They're all in the work itself, if that makes sense. Over here, over here to this gentleman. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, was, I was thinking about what, uh, what, what David said, where you get to the point where just somebody needs to say something. Um, and I was thinking about, um, I'm sure you've seen the recent Eminem freestyle, where even Eminem got to the point where he just needed to say something. Um, and I, I was just thinking about these breaking points and how there seems to be just sort of an endless stream of breaking points. And it's just um, I, my question, I guess, is is how we how we use poetry, how do we use poetry to, to cope with that, or whether you know healing comes out of that or or understanding. Um, just sort of that ecosystem, how they relate. I mean, I, you know, oh. Oh, there we go. Uh, I think Charlie, though, already sort of hit this when he said, like, you know, poems can't stop tanks. But what it can do is give you some sort of emotional connection to someone outside of yourself. And that's part of the existential dilemma, right? Is that we're always so embroiled in the eye. And we are, we, we naturally divide things. That's sort of how we learn apple with apples, oranges with oranges. These are primary colors. This is how we're sort of taught immediately to sort of, and we're, I mean, without, organizing is a very important tool in our development as people, as an animal. So like, how does one, but isn't that what we sort of think of as society as a tool to elevate ourselves apart from nature? And so like, how do, you know, and, and, and sort of um, getting away from these divisions is really an important part. And I think poetry can't do any of that shit, but what it can do is like, I can, like I feel a connection through this to this country, sometimes through its poems. Like Whitman, like, you know, like the, like, I mean, leaves of grass, like that, leaves, like that's in, I mean, regardless, I, that is a, it's a, a sort of train, and that's not mine, but like a train of a, of a book, right? It's always pushing and pushing, un, like relentlessly. But it, to me, that's not the most beautiful part of that book. It's the image of that. It's that, that, you know, we're all one individual blade of grass, and underneath there's this, uh, there, there's this invisible connection, and that's what that book's really about. And all the images in that just back that up. I mean, really, but that, that encapsulates everything. And that makes me feel a, a connection to this country, because Whitman, not necessarily what I see in the streets, because like, you know, I mean, I, like, you know, my, because my experience ain't been that, and you feel connected. You know what I mean, when you're stopped by police officers, and you have to tango outside of the car and reach around, and I'm talking about in the 90s. You know, like that's not, you know, when I would go and, and I would go play, and you know, people are following me around, you know? Like, so, I mean, I think poetry has the ability to connect us. And I, just, I, I hope that I'm able to do that with my work so that people can say like, oh, well maybe, and you know, somebody who sort of made some mistakes, you know, maybe there's something there to, to protect. Okay. 
just have a short question. One of the beauties of poetry to me is it makes us slow down and become more mindful. And with texting, with technology, with the accelerating rate of change, how can we put something as revolutionary and powerful as the word of poetry in front of people and have them slow down long enough to actually experience it? What are your thoughts? Um, a lot of people have talked about poetry as a, one of the things that it can do is become a form of meditative attention. And I think that serious reading and serious writing uh, have helped us to sustain contemplation and sustain our, capa our human capacity for a certain kind of contemplation and uh, within. And that uh, it, it's a it's a bulwark against this. I'm not saying it's going to win in any way. And I don't know what, how to get anything in front of people because the best way to put something in front of people now is to stick it on the screen of their cell phone. Everyone's got that in front of them most of the time. But for me, it's, it's po slow reading, which poetry requires. Deep, slow, contemplative reading. And deep, slow, contemplative writing will help preserve an aspect of human consciousness that probably can't be preserved by anything else. So, yeah. Um, can, I, can I go? I, I, yeah. I think that's a little bit of a non-argument too, though, in that like this is a conversation we've been having since the industrial age, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, oh, those do photographs are gonna destroy our way of life. Like, you know what I mean? Like, poetry will change. And if, it, and if it doesn't, then it doesn't need to be here. You know what I mean? I say that as a poet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that people, but I think that there will be people who slow read because it's important. They need to. And there's gonna be folks who don't. You know what I mean? But like. So just one. <laughs> yes, John. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think it's uh, uh, pointless uh, to talk about poetry. See, poetry is one thing. I mean, I have these sort of arguments, you know, with various writers. I mean, as I was reviewing, you know, critics and so forth. They, you know, speak of poetry as if there is one kind of poetry and uh, uh, one type of poetry. Uh, poetry should do this. There are so many different kinds of poetry. I mean, um, it's a huge planet. I mean, and. Uh, there are all sorts of poetries. They have some. Some of them are, you know, really have ancient, ancient roots. Um, to, to to pretend that it's all sort of the same, um, it's it's not. I mean, it's uh, uh, what we're talking about here is is a poetry at the moment in you know uh, United States of the last you know whatever years, you know, a few decades back. Uh, but the other thing that came. Uh, I was reminded talking about listening to when I'm talking about this is um, I like you know most poets of my generation participated in, in anti-war readings during the Vietnam War. I went to a lot of them, you know, great group readings and um, um, and we had exhausting experiences because it lasted for hours. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, you know, the rule is if there are you know, 15 poets or 20 poets reading, uh, the worst poet is going to read the longest. <laughs> you know, but that's, that was sort of understood. And, uh, but these were interminable readings, interminable readings. and. Uh, uh, I applauded, and I, others applauded because, I mean, there were, I mean, those poems didn't strike me as being particularly good, but they, like with the editorials, they say things that, you know, need to be, need to be said, and uh, it was good to hear them said. But uh, some a student asked me years ago, said, we're talking about that because uh, the student was very much interested in the poetry of the Vietnam War, and, uh, and we're running into a problem, which of course we all, our generation know there are not many good poems about against the war in Vietnam. I mean, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands are written. 
Uh, and I realized myself, uh, out of all these readings that I, and I heard, you know, Robert Bly, for example, had, you know, some good stuff, and uh, of course, Ginsburg had things, and, uh, uh, but the, probably hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of poems that I heard, I only remember one poem. Um, I, I only remember one poem because it was, it was, it was very strange, as you'll hear. Um, the poet, uh, who was totally an unknown, uh, I mean, I never heard of this poet again, uh, uh, he uh, sees Washington. Washington is dark, like almost a kind of a blackout. <clears throat> and uh, there's only one light. And the poet's eye, like a sort of a camera, you know, goes to find is where is this one light burning? And the light is burning in the kitchen of the White House. And in the kitchen of the White House, President Johnson uh, is sitting, trying to write a poem back to all these poets uh, who be writing all these poems against him, you know. LBJ, how many children did you kill today? You know, that kind of stuff. And uh, I don't remember what, what, what he, how much of that what he was putting down on the page. Uh, but the image was so powerful uh, um, that it stayed in my mind. Uh, in other words, you, you realize that some of these things, I mean, the rhetoric is gone and forgotten. And this is not the only image that I remember, but there'll be some, a little detail, a little image that lasts much longer than the rhetoric, the occasion, whatever it was, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so it lives on. Yeah. Um, I have, I'm going to call on somebody here. I wanted to speak to, yes, the, to the question about yes. the deep um, reading. I think deep reading and to some extent deep writing or thoughtful, mindful reading is, um, is a luxury to some extent. You have to have that kind of time to do so. And I think... Um, when we think about great change, we should think about um, a world in which people have the time to do such thinking. So just, I just wanted to put that out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Is this on? Yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to go in a, in a little bit of a different direction, but what I love about poetry is that it doesn't allow you to make quick assumptions that it pierces what? Like, for instance, I used to walk down the, this road here, pulling a little cart, looking like a little old grandmother, and I had a thousand syringes and a thousand condoms because I worked for the AIDS project, and nobody ever saw through that. And we make too many quick assumptions about people, no matter who they are. And, and poetry helps you to break that. And, for that, I say to all of you, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.